Welcome everyone to today's Name Community Project. It is my very great pleasure to introduce <laughs> Amanda Dayton, who I do remember from back in the day. Um, and so she is here donating her time to come talk to us about kind of her path through life so far. We've been chatting um, before the, the official start to the event and it's, I'm really excited. This is gonna be a really fun mm -hmm. talk, I think. Uh, we were joking that our department just has the best pictures of what we do, right? Like everything we show is just really, really neat. Um, so I think Amanda, you said you're planning to kind of go through and give a little bit of your of your life story here. Mm -hmm. um, but I just want to highlight that I mean we have so many wonderful, very successful alum. So we're I'm just so excited here. We have another one yeah. coming back. Um, I think I I did mention I don't know where we're starting like the published recording, but um, I know right now that you have started your own, uh, I think basically consulting company yes. uh, uh, called Revere Marine LLC. And I think that's really exciting. Um, so I know get, get to that point eventually too, like the, the thought process behind like all the, the different jobs that you've had and like, all right, I'm gonna, I wanna try this thing on my own. And I think that's not always something that people think about, especially when you're still right. in school, like that, that far down the line. Um, so anyways, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us and take it away. Great. So um, I'm Amanda. I grew up in Michigan, actually. And so I'd always been a, a Blue and Maze fan since I was little. And um, I got interested in engineering uh, in middle school, really. Um, a math teacher kind of turned me on to it. So I started taking these summer courses, like um, there was a uh, or camps, I should say, um, through the Society of Women Engineers. I had done a camp at Purdue in Michigan, just trying to get my bearings to figure out what type of engineer I wanted to be. Uh, I did a few job shadowing um, events with a chemical engineer and with an environmental engineer. And um, actually my friend's dad was a, uh, a naval architect and marine engineer for undergrad. And then he did aerospace engineering for grad school. And he was teaching at Western Michigan, because I'm from Kalamazoo, and um, he had highly recommended naval architecture. So uh, I did a, you know, a summer camp at Michigan, and we did the tours all over campus, and um, you know, everybody gave kind of a presentation for each department, and I just fell in love with naval architecture. I love that it's uh, all systems kind of engineering design, so you're dealing with structure and mechanical and piping and hydrodynamics and um, you know, there's the logistics aspect. And so I just really was drawn to that. And boats are romantic and they're fun and they're exciting. And um, and the boys were really cute in the department. So <laughs> I've dated quite a few naval architects. <laughs> so I got my MRS degree as well as my master's program. So, um, and I, I, you know, I kind of focused on shipbuilding a bit, like with grad school. Um, I did a graduate student research assistant position with Tom Lamb, and I also was a grader for, you know, the Engine 100 course. Um, so just kind of getting my feelers out. Um, a lot of people assume that naval architecture is a, a niche kind of field, but it's actually quite diverse. Um, there's a lot of different avenues to go, and, uh, and I sampled quite a few different things. Um, through college, I did internships down in Houston, Texas. You know, I was looking into the offshore industry at maybe building, um, you know, semi-submersible rigs or jack-up rigs um, or just doing offshore design support. Um, I had done an uh, internship over at NASCO in San Diego where they were building military sea lift ships. And um, I got to see what it was like to work in the shipyard and actually make you know, dreams come true, right? Drawings come to life. And uh, I just, I was really enamored with the shipyard and, and working with, um, you know, these blue collar guys that make things happen and really hardworking. And I think maybe that kind of spoke to me with my, with my background, because that's what my parents were growing up. And so I, I just loved the, you know, marrying of this white collar design phase into this, blue collar kind of production um, dream come true. So uh, I um, did quite a number of uh, interviews after college. Um, I interviewed in Virginia and Florida and Texas and um, 
but when my plane landed in Seattle, I knew that it didn't matter what that job was going to pay. <laughs> I was going to take that job in Seattle. And um, so it was uh, Seattle is this commercial kind of industry. Um, there's a big port here. There's a lot of ferries going on and uh, as well as the fishing industry is up here. So the, um, and tugs and barges or shipping. So it's a very vibrant marine industry in Seattle. And I see my picture back here too. This is my Seattle skyline. I had to do my shout out. But um, so yeah, I started, um, I actually moved out here with two other naval architects from University of Michigan. Uh, one of my friends went to work at Gloston, which is a design firm in um, Seattle. And my other friend had gone to Jensen Marine, another design firm, and then I had gone to Elliott Bay. Um, they are actually still at those uh, companies that they had started, you know, 15 years ago at, and um, they love what they're doing. They're doing naval architecture work every day and, um, and kind of climbing the ranks that way. For me, I, um, I wanted more than just design. I wanted to be out on the boats. I wanted to be making things happen, and I wanted to be more detailed design engineering rather than kind of functional concept design. So I, uh, I took a job up in Anacortes, Washington, which is about two hours north of Seattle at a, at a shipbuilder there called Dakota Creek Industries. It's very small. And, um, you know, they built fishing boats. They were doing um, a manned model of a destroyer to test propulsion systems. They're doing more military work now. Um, and they built tugs and offshore supply vessels. And, and they were very, um, very good reputation in industry. So I worked there for quite a few years. And um, I got to this point where I realized, you know, it was a small company. There's only so far you can go, really. Um, you know, I was getting all these new construction jobs, uh, but you know, at some point it's a bit of a rinse and repeat. You know, there wasn't, um, I wasn't on the innovation side much except for, you know, doing maybe continuous improvement projects around the yard. And so um, I had a LinkedIn profile because social media was becoming really popular. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons I picked naval architecture was for job stability. And, you know, during, both recessions, I've um, I've just been constantly getting job offers, and so that did not disappoint. Um, and I've always made a great living wage, and you know, I was able to buy my house when I was 30 and pay it off my student loans, and so it's provided a great life for me. Um, and so I, you know, a headhunter had reached out to me on LinkedIn and and asked if I wanted to um, be involved in this they called it a high profile <laughs> um, kind of environmental spill response system uh, for superior energy systems, which was down in Houston. And they specifically had asked me because of my location in the Northwest, um, they were doing the design in Houston, but they wanted to build and outfit it up in Bellingham and in the Portland Bellingham area. So, um, so I joined and I met my husband. <laughs> <laughs> at that job. Um, he was working contract and he was from the Webb Institute. So um, we got along and we were kind of on the same uh, brainwave as far as how the design was progressing and how we were going to do the outfitting and how to interface everybody and make it happen. So, um, so that was about a year and a half project. It was a contract job. Um, you know, I, I had thought that I was going to go back to Dakota Creek, but once I kind of got that taste of these bigger, more innovative projects um, and, you know, with multiple moving parts and I, I just, I kind of wanted to keep going that way. Um, and halfway through the job, my contract had run out with my headhunter who was, you know, she was a single woman that, um, she, you know, she just matched paired employees with employers. And I thought, you know, I can just, do it myself. I, I can. So I started my own business and um, continued a little bit of the contract with uh, Superior, but realized just how powerful that was to have a my own company in my back pocket. Um, the state of Washington has a lot of government contracts that um, 
they have required amount of funds that need to funnel through like small business, woman owned small business or veteran owned small business or minority owned small businesses. And so there's a lot of incentive there to, um, you know, for me to have that in my, as a plan B if, or, you know, for the flexibility and, and the more I've done it, the more I'm really enjoying it. Um, as a small business owner, you know, I get to pick what I work on. I don't, I'm not forced, you know, for someone else's ideas. Um, and if I don't like it, I don't have to continue. I can go find a different project. And, um, but so far it's, it's been great. It's um, exposing me to a lot more companies. Uh, I get, you know, the marine industry in general is pretty small, the commercial marine industry, even though it's, it's gigantic, but for <laughs> this kind of niche, it's, it's kind of small. So um, everybody knows each other, you know, the people you, you go to college with, like they're, they're going to be an industry with you. So, um, you know, I, I've worked with uh, other folks that have graduated from U of M and um, that I went to school with and but we've all kind of bounced around we joke that it's it's all the same names they, we just have different companies we're associated with depending on the project at the time so um, so yeah so I, uh, I had after that contract job was up I, I ended up working for FOSS FOSS was one of our vendors during that um, superior energy job so I did direct employment with them but kept my company open as an option um, I worked for FOSS for a few years. I started in the engineering department at the corporate office, um, doing stability and ballasting plans and design for you know tug modifications or the new tugs that they were building. Their, um, FOSS is a is a big tug and barge company on the West Coast. Um, they have about a hundred different tugs and barges from Hawaii to Alaska, and they're at most ports here. Um, so there was constant engineering work that needed to be done and. Um, they also have their own shipyard where they do a lot of their repairs because they're trying to save money. Um, and so after working in the design area and the engineering area, I'm like, I need to get in the shipyard again. <laughs> I really enjoyed the shipyard. So they were building a fireboat for the port of Long Beach. And so I maneuvered my way into the shipyard and started working on that, um, on that vessel and getting it finished and approved and out the door. And, um, and there was the, a, uh, an opportunity for me to get a, take a promotion into the management and executive level at the shipyard to do estimating and um, bid, bid work, the business development um, uh, area. It was a lot to learn because I came from a very technical background. You know, I, I never had to deal with the money before. Um, I, never had to like deal with putting a bid proposal together before. Uh, I, thankfully, I was a pretty strong technical writer. Um, so I took that promotion. And in the meantime, I, I wanted to diversify my background a little bit, not just in, in management and, um, and business entrepreneurship, but I also started taking an unmanned systems degree through Embry-Riddle just to um, you know, expand. I saw that more and more was happening with unmanned systems in the marine industry, and I kind of want to get into that. So um, while I was doing estimating and bids, I was also figuring out ways to um, do continuous improvement projects through FOSS. And, uh, you know, there was so many opportunities because FOSS has all this, you know, logistics of, um, you know, supporting the, the, uh, the market with you know, the logistics of moving tugs around and barges around, but they also had the repair and the shipyard. And um, so, so I started um, coming up with ideas of how to integrate, you know, unmanned technology into making the yard more efficient, which is what my presentation will be about. Um, I recently left FOSS after COVID and uh, I thought I was going to be home with my daughter for a bit, but um, a couple job opportunities presented themselves, you know, for my small business. So I've been doing those opportunities recently. Um, but I still have a, a passion for the unmanned, unmanned systems. So um, does anyone have any questions yet before I jump into the presentation? Wait a couple seconds. Um, after, after the presentation too, I can go over a little bit about, um, you know, this has been a, a male dominated industry, you know, a lot of the women that I had gone to school with, 
either did teaching or research and design, um, not many go into the shipyard. So for a while, I was the only woman in the shipyard. Um, and so I can, I'll talk a little bit about later pointers on um, as a woman in a male dominated industry, how, how you can still uh, get ahead and grow and get promotions because it's kind of tough sometimes. Um, so my presentation. So yes, to go uh, on to the continuous improvement for um, marine field robotics, I kind of coined this term. Um, this, uh, so this idea of, of marine field robotics was born out of a paper that I, I wrote for my unmanned systems class. Um, the, the idea was come up with a problem in you know, any industry, any area that could be solved with with uh, unmanned systems. And so me being most familiar with the marine industry, I, I picked the shipyard and um, came up with this idea that, well, I could use an ROV instead of divers to do chat and dive checks. Um, and so oh, here, let me, uh, I'll go to the next slide here. Um, so this is a little bit about my company. And, and as I kind of summarized before, I'm just going to step back, sorry. Um, you know, my background is in structural and mechanical drawing reviews, weight and moments calculations, you know, all the, all the things that we've learned um, through my naval architecture background. Um, and then through my, you know, experience in the shipyard, I have construction management, owner representation, um, taking that promotion at FOSS. Now I have uh, time and cost estimating backgrounds, which is huge, 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 huge. Um, to have, you know, to not only be able to design things, but know the best way to design them to keep costs down so that they're producible, they're readily available, um, your drawings are clear so that, you know, the foreman can read them and you have all the information on those drawings that they need to build. Um, so I have, you know, this full width of experience now. Um, I can write solicitations and bids and, you um, and then also with the with the field uh, robotics, these are you know more ideas that I, I came up with for continuous improvement projects. Um, I love this this cartoon about you know designing AI until it strangles you, right? <laughs> it's kind of overwhelming. Um, okay, so. If you're going to decide to um, come up with a continuous improvement idea and pitch it to management and have someone actually support and buying equipment, um, you need to come up with a business development plan. Um, this was a campaign for me, you know, in such a big company, they don't, um, and from such a traditional industry, they don't always uh, want to take risks. They're not always comfortable. They, they wanna see a plan, right? And so, you know, the first business development plan that I came up with, I downloaded off the internet and it was 14 pages long and no one wants to read that, no one. <laughs> and, and I was talking till I was blue in my face about, you know, how it would happen. But what managers wanna see is money and they wanna see a one page form of how this is gonna save me money and what we're gonna use this for and why. Um, so, I actually worked with our CFO as the chief financial officer to put together an idea of, um, of how much we were spending on divers and how often we actually needed them because we can't see anything underwater. So a lot of times if something's going wrong, you just call a diver. It's like a, a knee jerk reaction. They have you know the diving service on speed dial. Um, and so to break that like, Okay, let's think of another way. Let's let's call someone else first, and then the diver if we need them. Um, I mean, the the year that I had started this, we spent a million dollars just on divers. So um, I came up with a plan of you know what kind of things can an ROV do that um, we're currently using divers for that maybe you know we can do it a cheaper way. And so I came up with this list. Um, you know, you might hear of. Um, you know, continuous improvement has these uh, quantifying wastes. So they wanna see, you know, are we overproduce? You know, is this gonna help with inventory? Is this gonna help with overprocessing, overproducing? So um, I mostly focused here on like waiting because to make divers happen, there's a waiting time to muster all of them because you need like four or five people um, for every dive operation. This is gonna help with, um, 
reducing, I guess, the skill level, right? Like you, it, this went from a five dive team who's have years of diving experience to me um, running, a, a, you know, a remote controlled vehicle. So, um, you know, it, it saves money that way. We don't need um, all the extra skills and intellect um, needed for diving. And then, um, you know, over processing again, I, simplifying the process. We're bringing it down to one person, one machine, done. So um, the current labor costs at the time, and this is actually on the on the cheaper end. Um, every time we call out divers, and this is planned, right? Like if we have a planned dive later in the week, like we're bringing a boat up out of the water, and we wanted to check the blocks. Um, it's thirty five hundred dollars per dive, right? That's just one day. That's flat fee. And so we did about 25 of those a year. And so I estimated at least just, just for the planned dives that there's, you know, probably 80, about $88,000 a year that I was going to replace with the ROV. Um, small chunk, small chunk. So, um, and then I, you know, listed over here how, uh, how much it was going to cost to invest in the ROV. Um, I was able to get a very inexpensive ROV um, for $5,000. I got a camera for $500. And then, um, you know, I, and this is actually really high, this rate, you know, I was trying to do forecasting. I didn't know really what, what was going to happen. So I put, you know, how much it was going to cost per year. It's actually more like $100 a year, not $13,000. <laughs> so, um, so this difference, right? I'm expecting to save the company 70 grand a year. That pays for my salary. Um, and so we bought one. I finally was able to start kind of this new idea. And um, I, I teamed up with our dock master because he, you know, is kind of the most important person at the shipyard. Um, and so he was willing to try it out. You know, uh, he was also a project manager. So anything to help keep the cost down, um, especially in the commercial industry, everyone's very open to money savings. Um, and so, you know, applications, right, when the, when the vessels come and there's a crab pot um, stuck to the side, they want to know if it's in the running gear. They're always, the, the captains and the crew, they're very sensitive about the running gear, um, especially for tugs, because it's the propulsion plant that is the, it's, it's a structure carrying, you know, <laughs> some power behind it. So, um, so for in-water hull inspections, we're going to make sure the hull's good, the, the running gear is good. Um, I was thinking we could also do an internal tank inspections. So if you have some ballast tanks that are full of water and instead of, you know, emptying them and having to um, get a marine chemist out to make sure it's safe for entry and then climbing down in there and it's gross and, um, and dangerous, you know, uh, you know, we could just not drain it and just dump an ROV in there. Um, this one this is an inspection class ROV. So you can actually fit it through a manhole. Um, you know, there's a wide range of ROVs and, and what they do. So, um, but this is one of the smaller ones, one of the simpler ones, one of the cheapest ones. So it's more of a proof of concept uh, of what I was going for. And it's, it worked out wonderfully. Um, and then, yeah, the docking block contact verification, that was the bread and butter. And then, you know, if we were chartering a vessel or a vessel was coming off charter, we could do surveys for uh, insurance purposes or for new ownership, um, quality assurance documentation, uh, bid and dry dock schedule estimating. So if I, as an estimator, went out to uh, check on a boat to see, okay, what, what kind of repairs need to be done? I want to see what the what the condition of the steel is under the water, what the condition of the paint is, how long is that going to take me? So now I can get more verification on not just an accurate bid estimate, but how long I need in the in the dry dock. Um, and then yeah, damage surveys and propeller checks. This you know these are all things that happen sporadically, but if you have a bread and butter um, you know line of business that's uh, happening consistently, you can always add in some extra things. And um, actually, once I started using this, customers would see me out there, you know, checking the blocks, and they would start approaching me and asking me, can you use it on, you know, this Coast Guard survey that I'm going to do? Can you check this doubler plate that, you know, we need to, we need to maintain? So um, other people were coming up with other ideas as I was using it, which was pretty cool. 
that using this ROV was really convenient, super easy. Um, you know, if you need a station like this, you know, if you need to have someone else watching um, on the on the screen, this live video feed, you know, you can have multiple people doing it rather than just a diver kind of moving around. You don't really have control over the diver and you're hearing some underwater garbled information. So um, you have clear communications with um, with whoever needs to be looking at this, whether it's the Coast Guard or the customer or the dock master or you know, any, anything you're using this for, it's a lot easier to, to deal with. And, you know, people can point on the screen to say, hey, can you go back to this spot? Can you, can you target this spot? So, um, and the camera footage was pretty high quality. Uh, thankfully, the shipyard was in kind of a protected waters area. So I had fairly clear visibility. Um, it, it was a little more difficult. I tried doing a, a check in the Columbia River once and it did not go well, but <laughs> for what I was using this for at the shipyard, it was, it was amazing. Um, you can also add accessories to the ROV. So you can do, you know, sonar and hull gauging and there's whole companies that are out there um, doing this kind of work. Um, I was specifically trying to apply it to the shipyard, but um, you know, companies are out there doing bathymetry and, and all kinds of uh, different mapping techniques with the, with the ROVs and the, and the appendages that are on them. Um, so this is a, a photo example of, I went on a ship check and I wanted to see what the steel and paint was like. And, um, you know, I added more time because I, I knew what the condition of the hull was and I could prove it to the customer. Um, and so the customer had a lot more faith in my estimate and we were able to get that get that job. And I was able to prepare our paint crews and our steel shop. I'm like, this is, you know, heads up, like this is coming and this is what you're looking at. Um, this job, so, you know, one of the tugs came in with a crab pot floating next to it and they're like, ah, is it in the prop? You know, and I, I was able to just dump the ROV in because they were about to call the diver and I'm like, wait like let's see where it is and you know the diver can be more prepared if there's actually something in the prop so um i went and looked and it was just you know caught on a zinc so they were able to just reach down underwater and cut it and and that was it we didn't need a diver so saved four thousand dollars right there and that was, would have been a planned call out right they probably would have not have operated the boat in the meantime until while we were waiting for divers because they didn't know where what was going on. So um, I'm sure it saved even more than that. And the, you know, if they had to go out for a job and they wanted to call divers on an emergency call out, then that's $8,000. So, you know, the ROV paid for itself within one or two inspection checks. Um, this was Gilnet uh, caught in the prop. So this is one of our customers. They had come in uh, off, off hire and, you know, the captain and the crew, um, we're about to leave and the customer called me over and said, before the captain goes anywhere, can you please check the prop? <laughs> and so the captain's standing there and I checked the prop. I'm like, he ran over Gilnet. <laughs> and so they were able to deal with it. But, you know, typically if you're waiting for divers to come out, the crew's gone, captain's gone. Like you, you can't deal with it until much later down the road. So um, they were really appreciative that they could deal with the situation at the time. And they knew what was happening, right? They knew what, what to expect when they went into the yard and, and that this was gonna be, you know, an item on the, on the scope. Um, this was the bottom of a fishing boat. They sheared their rudder off. And um, this, I mean, they knew that they sheared the rudder off. That was pretty obvious. But for us, we were going to reinstall the rudder um, with divers. So they wanted to get a map of kind of where the pad eyes were and put a plan together. And so they were able to see what they were dealing with, how much clearance there was. Um, and so this, you know, the photos and video that I'd taken for that was great for planning. Um, this was a fun one. They, um, the boat was going out to a job. They, uh, they had just gone through the locks because the shipyard was in a lake and to get out to, you know, the Puget Sound, they had to go through locks. Um, the lock master had told the tug, you know, come through, you're good. And um, the barrier, the water barrier had not actually come down all the way yet. And so they weren't good and they ran right into it. Um, so they came back to the shipyard, called me. I ran out there and uh, did a damage survey. Cause they were like, do we need to call this job off or not? Cause normally, you know, if they're calling divers, they would have had, a, they would have lost the job, 
you know, and whether they didn't know if it was okay or not, you know, divers would have come and they would have done this analysis and they would have seen everything's okay. So they would have lost a job and they would have had to spend the money on the divers, but I was able to prevent all that. Um, I worked with the insurance agent. So this little laser scaler is measuring an inch so the they could see, you know, okay, there's some paint scratches or some dents, but I checked all the propellers they are all good everything everything was fine and they ended up going back out in the job and everything was okay and and now they can put that on their hit list for their next uh you know shipyard dry dock but the me you know they could still they can wait right they didn't they didn't have to do an emergency haul out or, or call divers so um this was a t is a typical blocking check so here we have the uh the dry dock has been submerged the boat's coming in so they usually set these these blocks um here maybe you can see them better they chain them down right along the keel um and they have a docking plan to do that and so all the blocks and the dry dock lowers the boat gets pulled in aligned up and then uh and then they lift the boat out of the water on the on on these blocks right so they're wood blocks um and so i worked with i this was i was doing this probably once a week once every other week um you can see some of the guys standing here giving me a hard time. They always like to, they made their own name for my ROV and <laughs> always like to give me a hard time while they're waiting and stuff. So, um, so yeah, so on the stern of the ship, you know, I would make sure that the keel here is centered on the blocks. Um, and then I would, you know, drive my ROV up forward. And so this keel, right, like you're expecting the keel to be about an inch or two off the blocks flat all the way forward right so i went forward and we had two feet um forward they they had gotten the docking plan wrong so um they you know got the boat out of there you know redid the blocks but so that saved us time for divers for the planned blocking and then for the emergency blocking that we would have had to do the next day so right there was twelve thousand dollars that we saved and it took me an hour maybe um and a lot less embarrassment, right? Because it's just me and I already worked there and, <laughs> and we could just manage with the customer. We didn't have to, you know, uh, deal with the dive team as well and pulling them back and forth. So um, this is another blocking check. I, and it was always fun, you know, this this dry docking we had to do in the middle of the channel. So um, just for the water depth. And so it was fun to ride the boats, be out there. It was a nice, gorgeous, sunny day. Um, and using my ROV. So um, yeah, so money, right? They wanna know the return on investment. So my predicted return on investment, I thought, okay, in five years, you know, we're gonna save $70,000 a year, which you had seen in the previous business plan. And so that means, you know, in five years, the ROI, 500%, right? We need, we need these. The actual, um, the actual savings was in six months, um, we had earned and saved about, you know, 47K. Um, and, you know, so that was, that was about on track and, and, but we had already more than actualized the, um, the return on investment. So we're pretty happy to have them have that extra cash. The other thing, which I um, had been in the process of doing is you can, so there's an option with Coast Guard and with ABS, with the regulatory agencies, that instead of dry docking, you can use divers in lieu of dry dockings. Um, and it saves the customer a lot of money and you can do this every other year. So for vessels like dumb barges or, you know, vessels that don't have a lot of touchy, I call it touchy feely stuff, right? Like bearings and things that they need to check clearances on. Um, so if there's no propulsion system, it's just a regular barge, you're just doing a structural check, you can do that with an ROV. And uh, using an ROV in one person versus a dive team and, you know, all this equipment um, can save a, a ton of money over, over the life of a vessel. Um, so we were working on, on getting that approved. Um, the, other, the other line, uh, business line that I was working on was... Um, doing laser scanning. So the idea for the laser scan was you would take the laser scanner out there and you would map uh, the vessel, the structure that maybe if there's a repair that needed to happen, for instance, on the bulwark, um, you could laser scan and then have the drawings done, uh, lofted, and um, the 
structure prefabricated. And so when the boat would come in, you don't have people out there templating and measuring and then doing the drawings and then building it. And then, you know, you, so there's time there saved um, as well as, you know, your, your, uh, the safety factor aspect. Um, you don't have people crawling all over the boat. You can just go out there with a scanner. Um, and if you don't know, I don't know, maybe not everyone knows. Uh, so laser scanners are essentially, um, they're lasers that pick up like a, a pixelated dot cloud and, and as well as photos. And it makes this um, three-dimensional model. And I, I had a photo here of a laser scan that I've done. So this, this vessel here um, was the RV independence that we had done at the yard. And so and this was actually just practice, but so all, you can see all the like the positions where I had the, the laser scanner. Um, and so what you do, it does a scan and then you kind of stitch them together on the computer and you make this, this full vessel picture. Um, you can see how the vessel changes over time. If you're getting hogging or sagging or um, structural problems. Um, so, you know, and it's a, a, the photos are amazing. People do it just for kind of as built, um, uh, models to be able to walk through the boat instead of trying to rely on 2D photos all the time or drawings. So, um, and this is all measurable and it's all to scale. So, uh, you know, I can take, I can take kind of a flat slice through the, through the deck and I can, you know, draw an outline. It's super, it's like cheating <laughs> um, instead of being out there with tape measures and, and uh, laser scalers. Um, so vessels that have been around for a while, this is, this is important, right? Like you have old drawings, you know, not everything was um, AutoCAD when these boats were built. You have old drawings, sometimes they're damaged. Most of the time they're damaged. Uh, a lot of times they're lost as the vessel is transferred ownership. Um, you know, people don't always think to scan stuff. There's, you know, floods, uh, I've had, you know, vessels that we've had to do all new as built on just because they were smudged up mess of a drawing, right? And we needed this information. Um, you know, we, uh, this, so this is what a typical scanner looks like. Um, we were able to model up this piping, right? This is a fire, damaged fire main piping. And so you don't need to have people out there shooting and aligning and, and, we could just um, go out there with the scanner and know exactly how much uh, pipe we needed and and where it needed to be repaired, and we could, um, you know, build it in the shop before the tug came in. So um, that prefabrication and and making things um, pulling pulling the whole schedule forward like that is is huge. It's a huge money savings. Um, and more and more companies are using this. More and more uh, engineering firms. It's to the point now that um, you're not competitive anymore if you're not using a laser scanner. You're gonna have guys out there, you know, bidding half the price now and, instead of templating. So um, it's become a, a huge competitive advantage. I just thought this this comic was cute, right? It's not a party until the, until the scanner comes out, so. <laughs> um, this is another, okay, so this was a, a vessel that I took a scan of and took, you know, photos and scans. And again, I was just practicing and, and um, you know, as much as I could get, I, uh, there's some holes here, but, you know, I was practicing. So, um, I got better and better about where to place the scanner and, and how to align it so that things were stitching together. I realized more that, it, you know, you have to be really cognizant of line of sight. And so if you can't see something, neither can the laser scanner. So you need to get it in there, right? Like I needed to have it tucked up under the boat more. Um, and there's top view. I took this from the dry dock walls. Um, you know, I, I thought having it at the shipyard was, was an amazing opportunity. The boat's already out of the water. You can get a full scan, um, you can build the library for the, you know, the engineering side of our, of our company. Um, and so, yeah, that's what they, that's what they started doing with it. And it, it became a very successful, uh, business line, not just, you know, for customers, but internally as well. Um, again, like in the, this isn't the same boat, but in the bow area, they went and did a laser scan. They were able to do a 3D model of it very easily um, because they had that scan. And then there's the there's the repair from this model that they were able to prefabricate 
and go in there and and fix. So um, we also had purchased a, a optical scanner, which is a lot less expensive, um, more affordable. So if you're just doing pipe runs, um, you know, it was an easy way to like map out the pipe runs to be able to go spool in the in the pre and do prefab in the shop. Um, yeah, I, I found I would take the laser scanner around the house and my cat was following me. Right. So it looks like I had 10 different cats because she was in every scan showing up. <laughs> but in actuality, when I stitched it all together, you know, it's just one cat. So I just thought it was funny the Pavlov's and Schrodinger's cat at the same time. So, <laughs> um, so this is an example of like the, the optical scanner. It's a little more pixelated, but you know, for pipes, you kind of know you don't need as much detail. Um, about size and, and uh, what's happening there. So um, so you would take, and this is just kind of the progression, right? What, what the engineers actually do with these laser scans or optical scans. So this is the actual pipe spool I had the guys put together. They thought it was crazy. Um, I went and did the optical scan, modeled it in 3D, and then you get the 2D drawings from that, and then you can dimension it out and get accurate dimensions. Um, another another option for unmanned systems at the shipyard are drones. Um, you know, more more people are using it for photography for fun, but you can also use it for work, right? You can use it for marketing. You can use it for checking stow plans. Um, you get you're getting good visuals of overall operations. Um, you know, uh, I just came off of a job where. We had all these cameras on the deck, right? And you're seeing you're seeing the bow and the stern and the winch and everything happening, right? But it's all one level. Well, we had someone come out with a drone, and so you could see everything working together, the overall operations, the tug alongside, the you know they were pulling fuel hose off of it, so you could see everything. Not just you're not limited to just the stationary camera views. Um, this was uh, you know inspection I had done. We we're about to deliver the fireboat. So I was like, well, why don't I take a quick orbit, you know, and, and see if everything we don't, so we don't have to crawl up on top of the mast, right? I can just, I can take the drone in and do a quick inspection. There was some, you know, blue, blue paint, painters tape around the exhaust. I'm like, I might even go up there and get that before we deliver this boat. Um, they're just amazing photos. This was, this was the vessel leaving Seattle going towards uh, Long Beach where she needed to be delivered. So uh, it was, it was, just gorgeous so um so anyway so that was my presentation for unmanned systems and opportunities um you know more and more surveyors are using uh drones um not just the you know the flying kind but the underwater kind um anytime you can get more visuals on something uh the better the better for prediction the better for inspection so um yeah they uh they have been quite helpful. Does anybody have any questions? I'm just going to go back to the first slide here, one of these more interesting slides. So while we're talking, but um, any questions yet? I know it was a lot to go over in a very short period of time. So um, that would pause for any questions. Anything? Kind of got a sm smaller group, so um, we can leave time at the end. Um, so I, you know, I, as I had mentioned earlier, this is a, a male dominated industry. Um, since I started, um, it's become, you know, HR has been, has done a wonderful job with um, training people on sexual harassment and, um, you know, workplace management and for, to become more sensitive to diversity and inclusion for everyone. Um, I personally, uh, I have joined um, women's professional societies. Uh, it just puts a, a, a little bit of, um, I don't know, extra, extra topics, extra flavor with, with women specific issues um, that have really, really helped me. Um, so I, I highly suggest, you know, every, most people are in society and naval architects, um, but I also suggest, you know, the Society of Women Engineers, the um, Women in International Shipping and Trade Associations, and and go to the meetings. Go to the meetings. <laughs> that is the biggest thing. Um, is is networking and and understanding options that are out there because you don't want to get 
in this enclosed traditional entrenched kind of space if you're trying to be innovative and competitive. Um, and I think there was um, one of my most memorable presentations, there was a woman from the University of Washington that came to present about, um, you know, how women can be encouraged to be in more executive roles, right? You don't see as many women on boards. And, um, and they've done a lot of research on why that is. And two of the main takeaways that I got from that, uh, one is that women tend to think that their work speaks for itself. Um, they work really hard, so that should get recognized, right, and supported and promoted. Um, there's another piece to that. And, uh, you know, from my experience and what I've seen and what research has shown is that um, men self-promote they make sure that people are seeing the work that they've done and they talk about it and they get it out there and they put it in front of their managers. And so um, when you're constantly self-promoting, whether it's your own company or whether you're in a you know, direct hire, um, you're raising awareness of your capabilities and um, people will think of you if opportunities come up and kick your name in. So, um, so yeah, show your work, self-promote. Um, the other thing is to get a sponsor. You want um, male or female, female's also great, um, and in executive management positions um, to, they're gonna, you're, you're gonna tell them that, you know, where your goals are, if you want to be, you know, a manager, a project manager, you want the opportunities, keep telling people, um, and then build those relationships of people in positions that can, you know, help you realize like what's out there or recommend you for those positions. Um, I often, you know, would go to, these professional society meetings and then LinkedIn has been amazing. Get on LinkedIn. Um, even if you're a student, you know, you can always use an internship or something, right? Maybe, um, and, and uh, follow up, follow up with a friend request on LinkedIn, you know, stock people, right? <laughs> stock companies. If there's a company you're interested in, start following them on LinkedIn and you'll get the, you know, what's going on in industry. You'll have um, more things to talk about, more things to ask. And, and it's, you know, again, raising awareness of who you are, what your skill set is, and, and people start calling you. Um, you know, with those two things, they were, they were huge. Um, you know, the getting this, the sponsor for me, you know, a, a lot of times guys, they, um, they go out golfing, right, together. They, they don't think to ask females, right, especially married females with children, right? They, um, they think, okay, this is just a guy thing or whatever. So um, with the sponsorship, you need to go ask them, right? Because you're, you're, it's professional, you're not on a date or something and there's no sexual harassment. Like you are going to ask them and tell them, you know, what you need and where you're at. So, um, you know, I, after hearing that, I had gone and, and spoke with, you know, our VP of business development. I took him out to lunch. I was like, come out to lunch with me, you know, I this is, you know, my husband, you know, you know what I'm trying to do. And I sat him down and I was like presenting like what I'm doing, where my thoughts were, where my goals were. And um, even after I had left the company, he still uh, recommends me, right? Like he's like, yeah, I'll sponsor you. I know that, I know you do a good job. He's worked with me um, and he's kicked my name in now on several jobs. And that just kind of, you know, builds up. And, you know, once, um, once I start working for myself with a different company, now I'm building those relationships. And then those people, you know, I, I tell them looking for sponsors, if you want to kick my name in, I would really appreciate it. And so they start networking for me and having that, having that presence in industry is huge for uh, career advancement. So, so that's all I had. I feel like I've been talking <laughs> for an hour now. I think I got it <laughs> for the most part. So, um, yeah. You can open up for a discussion and or um, or it can be done, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> thank you, everyone. So. Amanda, thank you so much. I'm not sure um, if there's any questions, but please feel free to ask. Um, what an amazing career you've had so far and you're still yeah. so young. So, so much more to come. Yeah. And yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. So if anybody wants to ask more questions or add me as a friend and um, I'm always sharing kind of the projects that I'm working on and, and reading other people's things. You know, I, 
I had um, a woman from Ohio State actually had reached out to me because uh, I was a career girls model. And she's like, I'm looking for an internship. I want to be in a shipyard. Do you know someone? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> I know Aww. lots of people. So um, yeah, making those connections, not being afraid to reach out. It's, it's a big thing. Even if it's maybe not something you exactly know what you want to do, just take that next, that next little step. Right. Just stepping out of your comfort zone. That's great. Yeah. Great yep. advice. I never thought I would be doing what I'm doing today when I graduated <laughs> college. <It's, laughs> so, yeah. Exciting. Pictures you shared were amazing. How fun. Oh, yeah. It Indeed. was, I love Seattle so much. It's so gorgeous mm -hmm. out here. So I'm not living in Seattle right now, but even Portland area, the Pacific Northwest is just fantastic. So. Great, great. Do we have any questions out there? If not, Amanda, we'll let you go. Hey. And thank you so, so much for, for being here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> have a great day. Yep, you too. <laughs>